Uh, I'm glad we're able to make this happen. Yeah, my brother. You know, we got the yeah. bottom tribe in here, rocking. Yeah, the bottom <laughs> tribe and, and, and the last you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's all good. Right. Yeah, I'm super grateful because uh, your name is has come up on this podcast a lot, um, especially over the last year and a half. And so now for us to damn near not have to speak for you no more, I wonder what you would have said. You know, we able to just pass the mic. I'm 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 grateful and I'm I'm really excited. Thank you, bro. I appreciate that, man. But you know, with Cuz right there, you know what I'm saying? He played yeah. he work, man. He found he found the legacy, so. It's all good, man. You know, you keep the keep the tradition alive, you know, from generation to generation. And that's extremely important. You know, it's important for our, for our young folks, you know, those who generation behind me, you know, and behind the generation behind them to know that this thing is not a, not a sprint, that it's a marathon. All right. And if we have to go from generation to generation to achieve our liberation and freedom. And that's what we have to do. And so it's up to the elders to be able to pass that information, that knowledge down to the next generation. And what I say is that I pass the baton, right? And the next generation got to be there, ready to pick it up, right? As I pass it on, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah a thousand percent. I mean, because I think a lot of times in the movement these days, there isn't too many like uh, intergenerational conversations that are happening. You know what I'm saying? Where we can learn from, you know, folks like you, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and the way to move forward, you know, the mistakes that were made in the past and how, how, how do we grow a, a movement that is organized, disciplined, you know, and following a, a, a political ideology um, that meets revolution, you know? Well, in terms of ideology, the ideology has to be based upon our history. You know what I mean? It has to be subject to the history and the conditions and the social conditions that we, that we live in, the political social conditions that we live in. We evolve an ideological foundation on the basis for our own freedom and, and independence, all right? But if you don't know history, then you're gonna have that foundation which you can build an ideological uh, uh, course of action, all right? As ideology comes from the word idea, right? And ideas are like what you think. You see what I'm saying? So the determining factor is this here. What you think is determining how you're going to act or how you're going to behave, right? If you think crooked, you're going to act crooked. If you think like a criminal, you're going to act like a criminal, right? If you don't think like a revolutionary, you ain't going to act like a revolutionary, all right? So that's the ideology, all right? So for us, you know, I, I think about the um, old song from the um, Parliament of Funkadelas, right? Some of y'all may, may, maybe remember George Clinton and, and the Parliament of Funkadelics. Yeah. And then one day song, they said what? Free your mind. Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? I'm not supposed to be the music one. Hold on. <laughs> free, your mind, your ass, free your mind, your ass gonna follow. Oh, and your oh. ass will follow. <laughs> <laughs> your mind and your ass will follow. So that's the idea, right? All right. We need to free our minds. You know what I'm saying? And if we can free our minds, free our understanding of what the conditions are that we're living in, and right, move towards our own national liberation, our own independence, you know, we're going to do the work, you know, right? We're going to do the work. But for long as our mentality is subject to our own oppression, right, uh, based upon the kind of uh, 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 repression that we have been under for the last 400 something years, all right, you know, we are traumatized people, you know what I'm saying? And our goal and objective is, is, in terms of the struggle, is to free our minds. Right from, from his trauma, right? And in the process of doing so, we will behave in accordance to freeing our mind, right? Uh, my book, for instance, uh, for the, for the, um, We Are All Liberators, right? The model, the idea, the slogan is that we have to liberate ourselves, all right? But we have to think in terms of being liberators, right? If we didn't think in terms of liber liberators, how are we going to be having liberation, all right? <clears throat> so, that is, I, that's the reason why the name of that book, all right? Because I want to put in people's minds that we need to be liberators, right? We need to be emancipators. We need to be abolitionists, all right? And if we can get in our heads, get that in, in our minds, you know what I'm saying? Then we're in the process of decolonizing ourselves, right? All right? So we have been, what, colonized as a people, right? And been thinking in terms of that oppression of the colonizer. All right, so now how we do that? We got to divorce ourselves from the colonizer, right? Divorce ourselves from the, the type of mentality that was been imposed upon us through centuries of oppression. That's a process, right? And it's generational, all right? Um, the civil rights movement made some, some very good strides, right? But their strides was to become part of the colonizer 
and that's separate from colonizing, right? Uh, and that was, that was a problem, right? And that's the reason why uh, uh, Willie Ricks and uh, Stoney Carmack came out with the idea through the civil rights movement for what? Black power, right? To distinguish the movement from that of, in, of integration and assimilation to one of empowering ourselves and our people, right? So you can't empower yourself if you want to be wrong, live along and alongside of and be a part of the colonizer. You can't empower yourself. They will not permit it. Not only that, your mentality in and of itself, thinking that you can empower yourself, being a part of the, the colonizer, is warped. Right? And it's subject to your own trauma. And so this idea of assimilation into a system that didn't want you in, 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 in the first place. Is, is skewed, a skewed way of thinking. All right, I'm gonna give you another example: <clears throat> white supremacy, white people, right? And the idea of white supremacy. Where did that come from? Now, why would anyone think that they can have be have, be supreme one, and then be supreme over other peoples? All right? That in itself is is a, is, in my opinion, and I think some psychologists will also agree, or psychiatrists also agree, is neurotic. So that's some neurotic thinking, you know. That's some God complex thinking. I was gonna say sadistic. Well, the, the practice of that <laughs> is sadistic. Yeah. <laughs> but the thinking in and of itself is neurotic. Yeah. Right. It's, I almost say it's schizophrenic because you're really thinking outside of reality, right? You're operating on the basis of thinking outside of reality. So white supremacy is a flawed idea in and of itself, and therefore it's a flaw, a flawed practice, right? And I tell white people, say, listen, you want to be white supremacist? Fine with me, right? You be as much white supremacy as you want to be. But when you try to impose white supremacy on me, I got a right to defend myself. All right? That's my right. So I tell white folks, the issues of white supremacy is your problem. Don't make it our problem. And it's important for you, white folks, to go to your uncles, your brothers, your cousins, right, your aunties, who carry that Confederate flag and so forth and so on, and tell them that they're wrong, that their mentality is skewed. Right? That's white folks' struggle. And they have to deal with that. It comes our struggle when they try to impose white supremacy upon us. All right. But in terms of in terms of developing a, a universal, our own universal humanity, right? In terms of white folks in, in, in of themselves, they have to go to they have to deal with their issues within themselves. All right. <clears throat> so that's that's the issue that we have to understand for ourselves in terms of how we're going to move forward as a people. All right. Anytime we hit, we can continue to find, put, expend more, more energy on white folks than we do on black folks, <laughs> we got problems, all right? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and that's part, again, that goes back to free your mind and your eyes will follow, right? Yeah. We got to free our minds, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, um, Malcolm once said <clears throat> that uh, he, he don't consider himself American, right? You know, he said he bought black, full black, and if it ain't about black, it ain't about him, right? And he don't care nothing about Americanism because Americanism is no more than uh, you said no more. The, democracy is no more than, than hypocrisy, all right? And that's the quote. That's the understanding how Malcolm understood uh, our relationship to America, right? And so when we come to that again, when we come to that understanding, right? We come to emancipate ourselves, come to the ideas of being an abolitionist, come to the ideas to be liberators, right? Then we are divorce ourselves from the mentality of want to be assimilators and integrators. All right? Because becoming that is in, essentially is this negation of ourselves. Right? We call it negation of the negation. All right. <clears throat> and so at any rate, I just want to share that that point in regards to what you were saying, you know? Yep, thousand percent. So so what led you uh, what led to you freeing your mind? You know what I'm saying? What, what was that like for what was that process like, you know, growing up in Fillmore and you know, having having a politicization, you know, what what led to what led to that, you know what I'm saying? And what led to you identifying as a new African and whatnot. And yeah, what's the story behind that? Uh okay. This that's a I lot in the one back. question, but <laughs> <laughs> but it takes it takes me all the way back, right? It takes me back to growing up, right? And it goes it takes me back to my mom, right? And I give all praise to my mom, right? For everything that she has done. For me and my and, and my siblings, although although we don't ever ever agree with everything, right? 
but we know it came from the right place. My mom, as a, as a young woman, young mother, she was a, a, an African dancer. She was learning. She was a student of African dance. All right. <clears throat> and in the process of her being a student of African dance, she taught my sister and I African dance. And one thing that she let us know that upon learning this African dance, that we African. All right. So that's what, sitting at the, at the foot of my mom. I learned that I'm an African. All right. I'm not a Negro. I'm not a Cool. I'm not any other derogatory name that they try to impose upon us. All right. And therefore, my thinking in, in terms of my own identity is that I'm of, of, of African descent. All right. I was raised that way. All right. Now, uh, as we grow up, of course, and during my days, we had to deal with the issues of Jim Crow, right? Self imposed, uh, the, the imposition of, of segregation and, and, and division between the nationality. And I remember one time. <clears throat> I um, was riding the school bus uh, to, to school, going to school, riding the bus to school. And at that time, black folks was, always had to sit in the back of the bus. So as a young, I think I was eight or nine years old, right, in Fillmore, living in Fillmore. And uh, I wanted to sit in the front of the bus. And the bus driver said, take your black ass to the back of the bus. So one white woman stood up and she said, listen, he can sit up here in front of me, with me. And the bus driver was a little pissed off about that, but I sat up front with her, all right, on way. Then when she got to her bus stop, she left, got off the bus, right? And the bus driver said, she's gone, take your black ass in the back of the bus, right? So I stood up and I looked around and see if there was any other person, any other white person who's going to stand up for me. None did, all right? And that let me know that there are some people who are good and some people are here to the law, all right? I went to the back of the bus, all right? And... That also informed me that in our social order, law rules. Okay. And so it was the law with a determining factor our people's behavior. All right. Jim Crow laws. Right. And then they acted upon in support of those laws. Messed up law, messed up mentality, messed up uh, behavior. All right. <clears throat> so that was a learning experience for me. One of the learning experiences for me. By the time I got into uh, uh, high school, Naturally, the civil rights movement had moved towards the black power movement, right? And we began the processes of trying to get black studies in high school. So I became a leader of the Black Student Union, and we fought for black studies in high school. Uh, one of the uh, person that impressed me at that point in time, because I was pretty good in school. All the time I was always good in school. Right? School was easy for me. And uh, one of the person was my math tutor was John Carlos, right? John Carlos was the iconic uh, photo of he and, uh, uh, and Tommy Smith. Raising their fists at, uh, uh, at the 1968 Olympics. Yeah, he taught you in school. He was, he was one of my, my math tutors. At what school was? Uh, what, what high school did you go San, to? At that time, it was San Jose, uh, Overfield High School, East Side San Jose. Okay, that's where I did high school at. Right, I went to elementary school in San Francisco, and a high school in, in, in San Jose. All right, um, and he was going to San Jose State University at the time. Okay, uh, uh, you know, track and field. That was his his. Uh, uh, his uh, athletic scholarship, I imagine. All right, and so during that during that time, the the a lot of times the um, the college guys, college kids, kids, particularly those in BSU, they would go down to the high schools, the elementary schools, and tutor the young people. Right, again, passing passing the forward. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and being tutors and and helping, assisting uh, the the younger people. Right, but we had a movement at that time. We had an ideology. Of, that we need to work um, uh, with and amongst each other, all right. <clears throat> and so that was one of the, one of the things that helped me evolve in terms of my uh, uh, my understanding of, of the struggle in and of itself. But naturally, when I saw the Black Panthers, right, two things. One, I had some old old elementary school friends at Sam Sucre who had joined the Black Panther Party, who I used to go down in Sam Sucre in the summertime and hang out with, right. And two, when I saw the brothers. Uh, do that march, uh, uh, march up to uh, Sacramento, right, with weapons, uh, trying to, to defy, uh, at that time, with Governor uh, Ronald Reagan, who was trying to change the law. Again, remember, it's all about law now, right? Who tried to change the law, because uh, at the time, uh, prior to uh, the Panthers started having weapons or carrying weapons, there was a, a California should be an open weapon uh, state, right? You can carry your weapon, all right? But now when Panthers stopped carrying their weapons, now they want to change the law. Well, for right? that, and the NRA came in, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, before that, you know what I'm saying? 
And so they wanted to change the law. All right. And so the Panthers went up to Sacramento, carrying their weapons, and said, hey, listen, this is what the law says. We can carry our weapons. So that was called the, the, the Edmonds Act. Edmund Edmonds Act, I believe it was, it was called. Right. <clears throat> and uh, they changed the law in order to, to uh, prevent black folks in general all right, uh, to possess weapons. Right. Uh, again, that, that's the idea. If you're using your weapons in support of white supremacy, then you're good. But if you're using your weapons in support of black liberation, then you're bad. All right. So let us understand how the law is applied or how the law is applied. So, and so ultimately, at some point in time, I decided to be part of the Black Panther Party. I had joined, I signed in and joined when I was 16. I right, went down to the office. I was helping with the papers with me and my boys, my uh, elementary school friends who had had since become members, and I was down to hang out, hanging out with them, and uh, working on uh, bundling the papers so they could be distributed across the country, and uh, assisting at that, you know, taking them out the trucks and so forth. And I said, I'm gonna join. I went in the office and I joined up in the Fillmore office of, uh, of the Black Panther Party. All right. Uh, again, I was living in San Jose, going to high school in San Jose. And so I was taking my information I was learning from San Francisco, I was taking it back to San Jose and in, in, in my engagement with the Black Student Union. What right? was and, what was the Black population like in San Jose at that time? Oh, wow. Um, I, I don't think it was very many, you know what I mean? Uh, San Jose was primarily uh, Mexicans and uh, uh, Chicanos and uh, Mexicans and white people, right? And there were a scattering of Black people. In the neighborhood that I was living, it was rather diverse. Uh, we had uh, several uh, black uh, families in there, and uh, uh, Latina families in there, Latina ex families in there, and uh, and mostly uh, white families. And uh, for the most part, we got along, you know. And yeah. once in a while, there was skirmishes between blacks and whites, you know, as you find across the country at, at time from time, you know. But uh, how many of y'all were in the Black Student Union? Oh, it was about fifteen. Fifteen. About 15, yeah, in the high school, you know. So. But then we have black student unions in, in, San Jose, in the high schools. We have black, uh, black uh, student unions in uh, San Jose State University and also in uh, San Jose City College. So y'all were all working right. together. We're all working together, right. I used to go on, on speaking tours with the uh, black student union uh, leader of uh, in San Jose State and also San, uh, uh, San Jose City College. And the three of us would go to different different schools and give presentations, you know what I'm saying, about black history, culture, Right and and issues of, of the struggle that was going on at that time, particularly in regards to the issues of uh, trying to get ethnic studies or black studies in the schools, right? And that was our goals and objectives then. Right? Mm -hmm. We got a problem, and in fact, we got a problem with that here in uh, Rochester where I live today. You know, there's no ethnic studies, there's no black studies uh, in in these schools, and we are we are working diligently trying to uh, change that change that reality. Yeah, I think uh, there's a important lesson there too. You know, you're talking about being in high school, then you also have the college BSU, and then you also have the city college all working together. All working together. I, I think right. that's a good lesson for black students today is like, yeah, you feel me? If you at UC Berkeley BSU, you should be tapping in with Berkeley High's BSU. You know, and Berkeley High should be tapping in with the middle school BSU, you know, and, and building building amongst the youth. I think that's super it's important. Extremely important. Uh, uh, cause the, and the reason why is because uh, uh, there's lessons learned. You're teaching, right? You're preaching and you're teaching. You're teaching and you're preaching, all right? And you, again, you're passing the torch from one generation to the next, right? You have the continuity in, in building a movement, and it was just extremely important, all right? And unfortunately, uh, with the destruction of the Black Panther Party uh, by COINTELPRO, right, was just devastating, devastating in the manner in power which uh, they destroyed the party. Uh, they used every type, every type technique uh, or tactic that they used to be, be uh, uh, to destroy a nation, a nation state, every type of tactic to, to, to do that, uh, they used it against the Black Panther Party, right? Everything from infiltration, assassination, uh, poison pen letters, uh, bombings, shootings, um, uh, everything you can imagine. Where they destabilize a nation, destabilize the country, use all those kind of tactics to destabilize and destroy the Black Panther Party, right? That's the part of the state. Right, and if you ever seen that movie, and I just saw it the other day, uh, the Fred Hampton uh, yeah. Judas and the Black Messiah. Yeah, Judas and the Black Messiah, right. 
Uh, one thing that indicated to me was the dedication of the brothers and sisters who were part of the Black Panther Party. They really laid down their lives, you know, for the struggle. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's powerful, right? They believed, right? Their minds were free. You see what I'm saying? And they're acting according to that. And so, and that's the reason why J. L. Hoover says that the Black Panther Party was the, was the greatest in, internal threat to the United States, right? So you have free-minded, free-minded thinking Black people. That's a reality right there, right? That's a threat to the United States. We have free-minded thinking Black people. Um, I know. I feel like a lot of us, especially the folks who listen to our podcast and me myself, I, with you and Blake being family, I know he knows a lot more about your, your personal history than I do. And I think a lot of us have got to know you through your ideologies, but I think it's very important for ourselves and our listeners to get to know you a little bit more as a person. Um, and so I'm definitely interested in hearing a little bit more about that story of, you know, you you going to school in San Jose, yep. working with the Panthers and Fillmore. Uh, yeah. So as, as you're taking stuff back and forth, what what is, what is the the continued process for you? Um, like as you get deeper and deeper into the work of the pa Panthers, and reaching these new ideologies and, and practices. Uh, well, one thing is, is continuity, right? Again, like I said, in our household, in my household, you know, we had pictures of uh, growing up. I had pictures of uh, of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Rap Brown and and Ron Karanga. You know, we had pictures like that on the walls in, in our house, right? And so my thinking growing up uh, was that this is what I was supposed to do. You know, this is what, how I'm supposed to live. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, to be an inspiration and, and a practitioner of the ideas of, of freedom, liberation, and independence. And so uh, naturally, after I got arrested, right, was captured and sent to prison, I continued, right, continued organizing while I was in prison. All right. So for me, there is no other way right, in my thinking, right? Uh, because the conditions for which we live in has proven that we, if we don't struggle, we're going to suffer, right? If we don't struggle, it, it's going to be a continuation of conditions of, of oppression, right? Of racism, white supremacy, right? And the exploitation of black people and black lives, all right? So uh, we have to engage, you know? Now, when I was young, of course, I thought we were going to have revolution in our lifetime and we we're going to be, you know, be victorious in our lifetime. As I mature, I understand now that it is a marathon. There's not a sprint, right? It's from one generation to the next. All right, like I say, uh, for people the other day, you know, we we engaged in 450 years of traumatic uh, oppression, right? We've only been 150 something years since out, out of that oppression, moving towards liberation. All right, so, I mean that's what 250 years or almost uh, 300 years of uh, decolonizing, uh, de-traumatizing. That we have to get over, you know what I mean? It's, it's a process, yeah. and uh, for me today, it's, it's a question of what I do today, what I contribute today, is make it something less that has to contribute, but for the next generation, uh, my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids. All right. So every contribution that we make today makes it easier for our, for those who follow behind us, right? And uh, that that's important too. Right. Have that kind of thinking in your mind that your contribution does mean something, as small or as big as it may be, right? It has an impact, right? A historical impact, at least a footprint, if nothing more, right? A, a footprint for someone to follow those tracks, right? And we have to understand that. And that's the reason why we need to continuously call our people to free their mind so their ass will follow, right? Right, so let's go. So now you asked uh, more about my my personal. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, so from you said you were, you got arrested at eighteen, right? 19. 19, 19. So what was if you joined? What, what what was those three years like for you from being sixteen, joining the Panthers in Fillmore, up until nineteen years old? You know, you talked about doing the 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 papers. Um, did you do programs, like breakfast program? Breakfast programs, uh, fighting against drugs in, in the community. Um, engaging in the free health clinic, supporting free health clinic, right? Uh, eventually, I was uh, recruited into the Black Underground. Yeah, hey, right? I, hey, I, I, uh, I'm happy that you speak on like kind of some of the more like, well, it's all dirty work, I guess. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I think so. So often people just get caught up in the the speaking and the monumental things, like going up to the Capitol and, and bearing arms. When it's like, what was the, 
you know, that day to day stuff that folks work. have to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's all the grunt work. We call it the grunt work. That's that's what's important. Why? Because the Black Panther Party have what they call uh, 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 survival programs, survival pending rev revolution, right? Mm -hmm. And survival programs was was the means by which the community supported the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party supported the community. There was a, a synchronization between the two, right? And what was important about that because when the police used to vamp on the party, the community used to come out and support the party. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, because they recognized that the party was an instrument in support of them. It was like an intercommunal exchange, you know? Yeah, absolutely, right, right? A reciprocal relationship, okay? Because they recognized the Black Panther Party represented their best interest, the community's best interest, right? And they were invested, therefore, they were investing in the community, and the community was invested into the party. Via the survival programs. The, the survival programs. Today, I call them decolonization programs, right? Mm -hmm. In my book, I call them decolonization programs, right? We need to develop decolonization programs. We need to decolonize ourselves from having such dependence on the government, having yeah. dependence on the system that is ultimately used to, to, to oppress us, all right? So we need to develop these decolonization programs. And we have to think in ourselves, these are the kind of programs that we're building, right? Alternative programs to what exists today, right? And, and, and creating cooperative working relationships amongst each other in terms of our needs. So if we can develop these decolonization programs and find ourselves growing more uh, dependent upon ourselves rather than dependent upon the government, then we can see how much more we can empower ourselves, right? Instead of being dependent. Right. And so decolonization is extremely important. And it is a process. Again, we got to free our minds and our behinds will follow. Right? <laughs> yeah, the fact. That's 100%. Because yeah. it's like so many folks are so obsessed with destroying, which is rightfully so, but at the same time, we're destroying these systems. We got to be building new systems and showing people that, you know, there's an alternative to the, the system that they're experiencing. Absolutely correct. I, I tell people, I tell people today, say, hey, ain't about what I hate, about what I love. Right? It's not about what I'm going to destroy, but what I'm going to build. Hmm. Right? That's what's important. So if you're building something, that means you're replacing something. Right? Yep. So let's build something that replaces the old and build something new. Right? Let's create alternatives to the existing system that has not worked for us. Right? And deliberately. Right? It's structured in the system not to work for us. All right? And we come to that understanding, you know, we have to create systems that does work for us. Right? Made for us, by us, for us, all right? And, and that's the idea of liberation, right? And building towards independence. So that's the process that we have to get in our heads, in our minds that this is what we need to achieve, right? Uh, unfortunately, again, you know, uh, we're, we're so caught up in, in the colonization system that we have become dependent, right? And so we have black folks who would say that, I can't live without no white folks. You know, I can't live without this system. You know what I mean? I remember like Chicken George and, and Roots. Right? <laughs> oh. When he said, I don't know how to be free. You know what I'm saying? You know, That's when real they, shit, yeah. though. That's how a lot of people live. Uh, I, I know they believe that. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to be free. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I understand it because it's a taught experience. All right? Like Pavlov dog. Right? You spend a Pavlov dog. You know what I'm saying? And if you ring the bell, the dog comes to the house making looking for the food. All right, we've been taught to hear that bell. You know what I'm saying? And go run to the master for the food. You see what I'm saying? So we got to get out of that, man. Yeah, yeah. That, that's two things I learned from uh from you and, and Kwame Toure, and and we are on Liberators. You talk about um not wanting to get us us needing to step away from the frame of mind that you know us not being on the, a dependent on a few good white folks. And you know, Kwame Toure also says. Um, they got you running what got you running around thinking that everything you got is at the hands of some good some good white boy giving it to you. Mm, mm. Now I, th that that is that's a fact. But now I want I want to make sure we understand also this. <laughs> there are some good white folks. Yeah. All right. And so and we need to have those who are woke to support our movement. All right. They've always been there, right? There was white folks who were abolitionists, you know, to support our freedom. John Brown. That's one. Right? Yeah. But it's more Garrison, that's another. All right. There was white folks who were part of the uh uh uh, uh Harry Tubman's uh, 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 railroad. 
You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, make sure that we got people coming out of slavery. You know, and, and so we need to have those same white folks today. Yeah, that's what that's what me and Blake been battling with out here. <laughs> just trying to realize, like, I don't know, you know, yeah, I think. Especially Oakland and the Bay Area is so, like, multiracial and, you know, everybody got a Black Lives Matter sign, you know, in front of their house. But, you know, that house was just stolen by a bank of a black, you feel me? And they just bought it and gentrified the neighborhood. But Black Lives Matter. So it's so it's so complex. Or or <laughs> you just get so used to being dehumanized by them. It's like a, a, a fight to not naturally turn into, them, you know what I'm saying? And you don't want to you don't want to model the the actions and ideologies of of those white, white supremacists, you know what I'm saying? The folks that you, again, right? Like the white supremacists that you named earlier. Um, yeah, it's it's hard though, but yeah, I, I think reading your stuff and, and thinking about the Panthers and the Rainbow Coalitions, realizing that like it's gonna take um, solidarity, international solidarity, it's gonna take, you know, white folks in our own communities to back us for us to really get free. We would be ignorant to think that we could do this all on our own as we try to build a new Africa. It's gonna take support. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And like I said before, it's gonna take white folks to deal with this white supremacy. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You know, they have to deal with their own country, their own white skin privilege, right? And, and understanding that their humanity is being at task, all right? That their humanity is being at task, right? And in, in essence, white supremacy divorces itself from humanity. It lowers, it's trying to lower it over humanity, right? And that's a problem that white folks have to deal with, you know, white skin privilege, right? And the system has has created this idea whereby they believe that what they're doing is right, right? That it is uh, in certain instances humane, or in in the most in extreme instances godlike, right? It's the quote unquote natural way of life. <laughs> and natural, yeah, natural way of life, right, right. You know what I'm saying? That's where the whole thing of eugenics comes from. You know this idea, you know, of eugenics, you know, of inferior and superiority, right? And some people are inferior, and some people are, are superior, right? It is a false premise, right? Again, if you, if your ideology is based upon that, then you behave like that, right? So we need to change our thinking. We need to change our ideology, right? And we need to change our ideology to what? Emancipation, abolitionist, and liberation, right? Emancipation, abolitionist, liberation. And if we take those three points and understand the, the, the qualities of each one of those, emancipation, abolitionist, and liberation, then you will in fact free your mind and your behind will follow. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you joined the Black Panther Party at 16 and then, you know, eventually you're recruited into the underground. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the underground and, and the Black Liberation Army and, and kind of the history um, of the BLA, which, you know, you outline it and we are on liberators, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, what, what I talk about in the, in the book, We Are On Liberators, is information that's provided by the Law Enforcement uh, Association or something, the LEAA. And that's where I gleaned that information from, all right? So I want to make it understood that there's nothing in that in that book that is not already known by the government, because that's where the information came from. Right. All right. Uh, what is also should be known, all right, from everyone, is that when the Black Panther Party came into existence in 1966, October 1966, one of the things that Huey Newton and, and, and Bobby Seals had, had written into the structure of the Black Panther Party was that one, rule number six, no Black Panther Party member can join any other or, or underground organization but the Black Liberation Army, all right? So the Black Panther Party was evolved in, from its own in conception that the idea at some point in time, it will be a Black Liberation Army, all right? Now, <clears throat> saying that, um, one LEA report that I remember reading was that in 1968, there was a major riot in Mexico, right? Uh, 1968, and they, the, the authorities down there killed a bunch of people, students and, and uh, uh, activists. And uh, according to one uh, report, one person that they found was killed down there, in his pocket was a note that was signed Black Liberation Army. Now, whether or not he was actually a member of the Black Liberation Army back in 1968, or that was something that was evolving from the Black Panther Party, we don't know, okay? Well, what we do know is that at all times in the history of, of Black people in this country, there have always been that kind of resistance, armed resistance, all right? From the various, various slave rebellions across the country, throughout the history of, of Black people in America, 
to uh, uh, Robert Williams and, uh, and, and him having had to go into exile by fighting the Klan uh, from the uh, um, African Blood Brotherhood. Uh, many people do not know anything about it. They should learn about it. African Blood Brotherhood it was armed resistance against the Klan to, to the uh, uh, Deacon of Defense, right, who supported the, the Civil Rights Movement, armed men, deacons, preachers, etc., right, uh, in defense of black people, right, to the point where we have the existence of the Black Liberation Army that came into existence during the, during the party. So the, the idea that people resisted itself, resisted or armed themselves to resist, is nothing new in the history of our country or history of, of this country in the history of black people. We just, they don't tell us that, they don't teach us that, all right? Uh, they only want you to be passive or passive resistant, right? The civil rights and all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, there's nothing uh, out of history in terms of uh, there has been young people who arm themselves and to resist uh, 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 police brutality and, and police terror, right? White police terror in our community. Uh, there, there's nothing new about that. Uh, what is new about it was that it was organized, okay? It was organized to an extent where it became a, a serious, they thought, a serious threat uh, to the country. And that's the reason why they clamped down on it so toughly, so ruthlessly, and, the, and destroyed the Black Panther Party. And the, the NASA, NASA, I remember, because it was infantile in terms of the structure and the organizing. And the we also got to remember also that the Black Panther Party was a youth organization, all right? At the inception of the Black Panther Party, was nobody older than 30 years old, right? We're 30 years and younger, all right? The, the primary, most members of the Black Panther Party was teenagers, right? Major youth organization, all right? That was supremely, supremely in love with Black folk, with Black people, right? And wanted to do the work, wanted to sacrifice themselves in doing the work. It was a youth organization, all right, for the most part. And so uh, by virtue of our understanding of that we was engaged in and believed that we were going to build, uh, a, a revolution, not necessarily knowing all the principles and tactics of, of doing so, uh, having studied, for instance, the struggles that was going on in, in, in Africa, study the, the struggles that was going on in Latin America, right? the Cuban Revolution, uh, the struggles in, in, uh, in Angola, Namibia, uh, Mozambique, uh, Guinea Bissau, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, what's going on down in Tupamaro to Latin America, uh, Zapatistas, and et cetera. We, as young people, Took those what was happening in Algeria, uh, Battle of Algeria, as one example. Once one of the uh, movies that we were uh, had, to, had to had to go watch and had to had to study, uh, the Battle of Algeria, as another example. Um, it inculcated in the idea, the thought that we can, in fact, engage in armed struggle. All right. uh, but we were infantile, infantile in, in as much as we didn't understand the depth of the of the opposition that we was engaged in. Right, the military might uh, that we engaged in. And so uh, uh, some of the people said it was adventurous uh, for us to engage in that kind of struggle, right, kind of armed struggle. Some people said it was necessary, right, in order to put checks and balances, right, on the, on the type of uh, uh, impunity uh, that law enforcement was engaged in in killing black people, right? Now, one thing you, you can look in history uh, and statistics and, and you can see that, for example, uh, the level of people, police murders of black people prior to the BLA, right, and the decreasing of police killing of black people when BLA was operating to the destruction of BLA and then the increasing of police murders again. All right? All right. That is statistical information that you can find in history. All right? So that's what that tells you. That tells you that when you engage, right, put some checks and balance on things, you save some lives, yeah. right? So when they function, it. yeah. But when they function with impunity, you know what I'm saying? Then you know our, our lives don't matter, All right? Uh, so uh, let's, now let's, let me get to that point because Black Lives Matter, again, it's a social consciousness movement, right? And I define it as a social consciousness movement and the trend and the tendency, right? It's like the Black Consciousness Movement of uh, uh, Steve Biko right, in South Africa, all right? Uh, raising the consciousness of people for their own liberation. The Black Lives Matter is, is basically that. It's not a military organization. It's not a revolutionary organization. It's a social consciousness movement, right? The raised consciousness and the idea is that 
they, we, need, we need to value the lives of black people, right? And so why would the government seek to resist the idea that black people's lives matter? Or there need to be a social consciousness movement, right? Because it lends to the ideas of independence, emancipation, abolitionists, and liberation, right? So they don't want you to be having ideas that you're thinking that you have some value. Because if you think you value, what you gonna do? Anything to maintain that value, anything Absolutely. to show that value. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that is the power of the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's the reason why the FBI came up with this idea, what they call it, a black extremist. Black identity. Uh, black, black identity extremist movement. Yeah. So if you think yourself, if you, if you, if you value yourself as a black person, <laughs> you're all of a sudden you become extremist. <laughs> Your identity has become extremist because you value yourself. What? <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. Hey, it's, it's, it, they, they'll tell you what, they, what they're thinking. They'll tell you what you're thinking. You know what I mean? This is yeah. how you think. All right. Straight up. You, um, You've been you've been speaking on this in terms of when you mentioned all these uh, revolutionary moments uh, and revolutions that that actually came into fruition. But I was I wanted to hear you speak a little bit on you know there are people who think that liberation can be found without violence having to be waged by those being oppressed. There are there are black folks, there are African folks that believe that we will get free without checks and balances, as you just named them. Um, and, and what can you say to that, to those people? I can say what Malcolm said, right? Malcolm said, listen, <clears throat> basically said, uh, we have the right to defend ourselves, right? And that's the whole idea. Remember, the Black Panther Party, original name of the Kennedy system was Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, right? And so our idea is that we need to preserve our existence. Right, and so if we need to preserve our existence, then there should be no bounds or or reserves, a reservation in doing so. All right. Uh, so I believe in self-defense. All right. If you're coming after me, I'm gonna fight back. All right. I gotta preserve my existence. I got I got a human right of self-preservation. All right. And I think all black people should have a human right of self-preservation. Right, and so self-defense is 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 inherited of, of the idea of self-preservation. All right, and so you know I'm not going to publicly uh, tell people that they need to arm themselves and or go out and strike out against the system. We tried that, uh, and if it's not organized right, they're going to destroy you with the quickness. All right. And I'll tell you what Fred said, right? That our movement is based upon people. All right. If you go watch the movie, he'll, he'll give you lay it straight out. Based upon building a movement of people. That the power is in what? The people. The people. That's why we have that slogan, power to the people. All right? Because it is government is based upon people's consent. And if you are consent to oppression, then the government will continue. All right, so <clears throat> yes, we need, we need to figure out the ways and means to which to defend ourselves at all times, right? For the idea of self-preservation. In the course of doing so, we need to organize people because that's our best defense, right? We're changing people's minds. And the more people's minds have been changed in support of the struggle, right? The less we have to deal with the questions of armed resistance, right? Or engaging in armed resistance, right? So my my goal, my thinking is that we need to build a mass movement, right? So mass movements change the system. It changes entire government. Mass movements does, right? So we'll take the the quote of uh, I think it was Mao Zedong that political power comes out the barrel of a gun, right? <laughs> but yes, the gun has to be mass people. Right? Not a few individuals. You see what I'm saying? And so that quote it can be taken out of context. Right? And we need to re really put it in, in the proper context. Now, in the proper context, that we need to build a mass movement. All right? That's the proper context. And then you defend that mass movement.
Yeah, I think it's just being aligned with the masses, then you're able to move. You know what I mean? If you don't have a mass amount of people fighting objectively, you know what I mean, with the same like ideological framework, then then you know the chances of victory isn't there. You know, yeah, it all ties exactly. back into organ to, into being organized. Like I think Absolutely. sometimes people think organizing is just like be, taking up the same amount of space. It's like not nice being aligned on every reason of why y'all taking these actions. In fact. That's a fact. Because what good is right. the gun if you don't know the reason even why you're using the gun? You know what I'm saying? You know, what good is... <laughs> what good is handing out the meals if you don't know why you're handing out the meals? What good is the BSU meetings if you don't know why y'all meeting? <laughs> what good is a medical clinic if you don't know why you're providing a medical clinic? <laughs> you can go on and on, you know? Yeah, go on. That's, that's, that's a fact, bro. And well, so that's, that's, that's what we are uh, in Jay. In my book, you'll find that I put forth a theoretical foundation called Three-Phase Theory for National Independence. All right? And so it, I try to raise down a, a, a roadmap, right? A plan of action. It's a revolutionary well, cookbook. Gives you the plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a manual, right? Yeah. If you follow the manual, if you follow the manual step by step, then you'll get to the, to the, the, to the logical conclusion and, yep. and result. Yo, that's going to be free, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's the important thing. And and I'm, I'm to be honest with you, I'm I'm a little bit uh, surprised to find how that book was written over 20 years ago, or 21 years ago when we first wrote, and the second printing was uh, uh 10 years ago, almost 11 years ago, second printing, and you still find that it still resonates today. So it must be something in there that has some value. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things in there with a lot of value. I'll tell you that. You, you know, you you very humble. <laughs> you very humble. But when I was talking to you the other day, I was like, man, why like you legit predicted a Kamala Harris. You legit predicted a Barack Obama. You feel me? And like, you know, I know you said that some of the language is outdated, but for me, I was like, nah, this this language is predicting and giving me a clear guided outlook on everything that's going on in society and gives me a clear view of like what I need to do to move forward. You feel yeah. me? If if I want change. Well, well you, you both you you and Delancey, y'all doing the work for what I understand, y'all doing the work there in, in, in the bay. You know what I mean? Y'all y'all putting it in. And I, and I, I salute, right? Hey, we, you we salute doing, you. Right? We salute you. Yeah. You feel me? Learn from the, you know, learn from you. You know what I'm saying? Like we learn from our elders, and we just a product of that. You know, like Definitely. one thing I say all the time on here is like, you know, Delancey says all the time too. The things we talking about isn't new. You know, we <laughs> we learning. You know, and we regurgitating a lot of the things that we learn. You know, from folks like you, folks like Asada, folks like Kwame Ture. You know what I'm saying? Um, we don't forget our brothers inside. Matulu Shakur, right, Sumiata, right, uh, 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 Poindexter, um, uh, 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 Chip Fitzgerald, right. Uh, we got we got a host of, of comrades inside prison that needs to be out. We got a young brother named uh, uh, Kwame Shakur uh, in Indiana needs to be out. We got a brother uh, Rashid uh, Johnson needs to be out. Right. We have some we got some heavy the theoretical brothers inside prison, you know, uh, surviving the madness. And I know what they're surviving, man, because I've been there. I was there almost 50 years, yeah. all right? And I just got lucky, uh, you might say, you know, in terms of them I'll give me an opportunity uh, to be with my family, to be with my moms again, to be with my kids, you know? First time, now let me say something uh, uh, for me, right? And this is personal, right? Uh, my release on October 2020 was the first time I ever spent any time with my daughter on the street. She was in the womb, in the womb when I was arrested, when I was captured. All right. So the first time we ever had to spend any time at all in the streets, me being a free, quote unquote, free man. All right. That's a beautiful thing, man. Beautiful yes. thing. Yeah. And so this idea of mass incarceration and how it has imposed, again, some trauma on the black community, you know, separating uh, 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 fathers from their kids or mothers from their children, right? Uh, uh, divorcing, uh, splitting up families, et cetera. Not only that, but then it's also uh, inhibiting the growth potential of black people in this country. Because here you have uh, young young boys and young women sent to prison uh, at their most productive years, right? their most productive years, and sent away 10, 20, 30, 40 years. All right? So where's the production of the procreation of our, of, of our people? All right? That's, in, in, in essence, that program, that practice is genocidal, right? In whole or in part, right? And the part is that they're preventing us from reproducing, right? From generation to generation, 
right. So you got uh, eight or nine million uh, uh, black people, men and women, over a period of time, over years, and unable to produce. Ain't no wonder that our population in the United States in the last 50 years ain't, ain't past 15%. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, they ain't killing us, they put us in penitentiary so we can't produce, you know? Or sterilizing the women, you know what I mean? Uh, come on, but let's, let's look at the reality of the situation, you know, and how it has impacted our lives you know, over, over the last 50 years. Just, just say 50 years. Now, how does it impact our lives since the, the destruction of the Black Panther Party, since 1970, 71, right? Come on, let's look at this thing from, from really has it, kind of impact it has social economic and politically on, on our community. It's been devastating, right? On introducing the crack in our community. We all know that it was introduced by the by the CIA. Cocaine was introduced in our community by the CIA. We all know that. it's well documented. Cocaine right? intelligence agency. Yes, that's right. Two intelligence agents and the FBI, right? Uh the, the what do you call it? Iran Contragate. Uh Iran, uh, uh yeah, the Iran Contragate. Yeah. Uh 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 Trafficking drugs for weapons, for for this uh, for the the Contras uh, in Nicaragua, right? And using Iranian drugs, or Iranian transport. I don't know how they was doing it, but they, you know, uh, Gary Webb he did a hell of expose on that, you know, exposing all, all that. And they made some movies behind it, and then he ended up dead. The reporter, white guy, right? Under, under suspicion. I don't know why, but yeah, right by exposing it. But this is well documented, you know. Uh, how they have during the, during the Vietnam War, you know, they had what they call the Golden Triangle. That's when uh, heroin was prominent, predominant in our in our community, right? Uh, to 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 suppress what to suppress uh, uh, the movement at that time. There was riots going on across the country. When then they introduced heroin in the community, the riots dissolved, right? Uh, disappeared, dissipated, right? Because because the community was injected with this uh, with this heroin from the Golden Triangle, uh, fools like uh, uh, what is his name uh, Frank Lucas and uh, Barnes and Mickey Barnes and and them characters, you know what I mean? Uh, saturating our community uh, with this poison, you know. Um, during the party, we fought diligently against this poison in our community, right? Uh, we uh, we had pamphlets put out. You know, uh, fighting against uh, the, the drugs uh, in our community. You know, so uh, hey, man. You know, and now today, the next go around, what they come with? They come with this crack, with this cocaine, right? Now they got what they call it. What they call it? Deuce, right? Whatever this stuff is that they, these kids are taking out, madness. They're destroying the people, destroying the brain, brain cells with that with this crack. You know, and mm -hmm. so again. What's the mark? Free your mind and your ass will follow. Right. <laughs> on on the topic of us freeing our minds, mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about identity. And first, I'm going to read you a quote by Kwame Ture, and then we're going to get to the question. So right. Ture says, you must know if you're African or American, because America is Africa's number one enemy. Uh, can you talk about how that quote directly relates to why you identify as new African? And what was that uh, decolonization of your mind that led to that? Well, I told you I was already, already identified as being African, right? From 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 sitting at the foot of my mom's, mm -hmm. right? So I grew up with that idea. Right? I'm African, right? Uh, uh, Blake, no, you know, our, our grandfather, my grandfather, uh, back in 1970, uh, 70 or 71, started us the family with Kwanzaa celebration. I've, I've been to a few of those. Yeah, that's right. right. It's, part of, it's a tradition of the, of the bottom family. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We do Kwanzaa, you know, you know, to maintain that kind of culture. If, if anything that Ron Kwanzaa has really um, um, gave to, to our struggle, right? If anything other than the idea of culture nationalism is going to free somebody, or <laughs> with Kwanzaa, okay? And I, I salute uh, 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 Ron Kwanzaa for giving us Kwanzaa, okay? It's a very important tradition. But then Google Saba is very, very important for us to study and understand and, and live by it in Google Saba. But uh, uh, as you asked the question, uh, I was in prison. Uh, I think I was in San Quentin and I was communicating with Imar Obadeli, 
Mario Bedetta was the first president of the Republic of New Africa, right? And we got to understand that it was a split in the in the party. Ideologically, it was an ideological split in the party, in, in respect to the issues of uh, of of uh, um, a New African liber New African uh, program, the provisional government of New Africa. It came into existence in 1968. It came into existence in 1968. Uh, 500 New Africans, the 500 Black people, uh, in uh, Detroit. And, and a church in Detroit. A lot of people don't know that that church was the church of uh, Reverend Franklin. Who's Reverend Franklin? That was Aretha Franklin's daddy, right? Aretha Franklin's daddy was a nationalist, right, for the most part. I think he grew up as a Garveyite, right? He may have been a Garveyite during, during his growing you know, period. A lot of people don't know nothing about Garvey, but that's another story, okay? Uh, who's a Garveyite? And as a result of his own understanding of oppression, he permitted these five nationalists, these 500 nationalists, to have a meeting in his church. And then they came in, came in, at that church in 1968. They decided that they're going to create what they call the provisional government of New Africa. And what is New Africa? New Africa is the five, five states of the, what they call the Black Belt, right? And they declared for themselves that this state, these five uh, um, uh, states, should be the homeland of Black people in the United States. Right? And so they evolved what they call provisional government of New Africa. Now, let's go back a little further. During the Civil War, almost at the conclusion of the Civil War, <clears throat> uh, General Tokumisi uh, Sherman will put out what is called Field Order Number 15. And you find that, right? And Field Order Number 15 indicated that certain lands from South, South Carolina South to the Florida Basin will be under the control of the emancipation of African people. Black people at that time, Field Order Number 15. And Field Order Number 15 <clears throat> basically established what, what, what then became uh, Black Nationhood or Black uh, uh, black Belt South. All right. <clears throat> and, um, and they were being, being protected by the Yankee soldiers, right? These Black folks who were emancipated, right? During the course of the Emancipation Proclamation. And we were protected by black folks. I mean, protected by the, by the uh, Yankee Army. <clears throat> and they was establishing what they call freedom bureaus, all down the South, right? Uh, where they began to began to build the kind of organizations for their own emancipation and of their own uh, quote unquote liberation, right? Mm -hmm. Taking control of the resources that were available to them for their own survival, right? During that period of time, that's right, uh, right before the, the ending of the Civil War. Seven years later, I think uh, 1987, uh, they had um, uh, a um, an election, presidential election, right, between Rutherford B. Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden, and Rutherford B. Hayes won the popular vote, but he did not win the electoral vote. Okay, and so then they had a compromise between Brother B. Hayes and Tilden called uh, uh, the Tilden or the Hayes uh, uh, Compromise, right? Hayes Tilden Compromise. And Hayes Tilden Compromise established the, the basis by which uh, Hayes would win the presidency, but in order to do so, he had to withdraw the Yankee troops from the territory, liberated territory of black people. All right, and so the Yankees uh, army withdrew from the territory of black people were maintaining building liberation or independence, uh, building nationhood. And that became the event of, as the course of reconstruction came the event of what? The reconstitution, reconstituting of the Confederates into the Ku Klux Klan. And it had 100 years of lynching down the South, all right? And destroying what was then the part of the reconstruction, post -Man reconstruction, destroying reconstruction, and it started the first migration of African people up north and to other parts of, of, of the country. And so <clears throat> when we look at that history, we can see at one point in time, we was already moving and building toward other kind of nationhood and liberation, uh, and that was destroyed. So around 1968, uh, knowing this history, these, these 500 people uh, came together and said, listen, we're gonna rebuild. We're gonna reestablish ourselves and we can build what we call the uh, provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, all right? And again, like I said, I was in prison and I was engaging uh, uh, Imari Obadeli, 
who was in Marion prison at the time, and uh, along with his uh, his brother. And uh, uh, I decided at, at that point in time that I would become a member of and a citizen of the original government of the Republic of New Africa. Right now, let me ask something. Let me add another point to this. What this thing New African is? What, what is that? Right. And one of the things that we have to understand in terms of our history as people in this country that we are a, an amalgamation, a messenger nation of other groups and peoples. Right. Uh, remember that coming to, coming being brought here to this country from off the African coast, right? We had the Mandicas, the House of Fulanis, uh, Mandingos, uh, Ibu, uh, um, all the types of different tribes were brought to this country and it was brought together and it was made to messenger messenger together or amongst each other. All right. Not only that, but we also had the Portuguese, the Dutch, the English, the Spanish, who were also messenger into our bloodstream. Not only that, we also had the, the, the Creek and the, uh, 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 the Seminoles, right? And the Cherokees, right? Messaginate into our, our bloodstream, right? In our, in our genetic blood clothes, right? And so by understanding that, accepting that history, right? Uh, 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 recognizing and accepting that history, right? We said, well, then in, in essence, we have created a new African, right? And so that's where we come to that identity. It's come to our own identity of who we are as a people, right? As a people in this country, right? We comprise all these nations, right? So who is better to talk about these issues on both on the humanitarian and worldview than us, right? right? We're the most oppressed and the most want to be free, okay? And had had these kind of relationships with all other peoples on the, on the planet, including Africa, Portuguese, Spanish, the Dutch, and the English, and the Arabs, to name a few, right? So given that understanding, that reality, right? Historical reality, why not accept that reality and give it identity, right? And in doing so, what do you do? Free your mind, and your ass will follow. Yeah, so I'm New African, right? I do not identify as me being American, half American, half American, half African, African American. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We split, split this thing down the middle. No, uh -uh. I said all that. Okay, I'm a new African. You see? And that's how, you know, again, we have to decolonize ourselves and our thinking, right? Decolonize ourselves, right? Become actually a free people, a free person, right? And it's a process, bro. It's a process. Definitely. You know, we see New Africa like as a part of our liberation um, uh, of African people here you know, in this land, this so-called America. Um, can you talk a little bit about how New Africa and uh, Pan-Africanism align? Oh, well, hmm. Yeah, they align because we have people in the diaspora. All right? That's point number one. Uh, and so for Marcus, uh, Marcus Garvey, he came, since he came with the idea, uh, I'm saying he's not the only one, but since he came with the idea of being a Pan-Africanist, all right? and the Marcus Garvey movement. The Marcus Garvey movement it was the greatest movement of black people uh, in, 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 in the history of, of, of our struggle. All right? And a lot of people don't know that, uh, that he had uh, organized, his, his organization came from all the way from Brazil and the Caribbean, uh, England, uh, Africa, and the United States. Right? Uh, and he brought the, he brought, one brought the, the flag, you know, people don't know that, the red, black, and green flag. Marcus Garvey brought that, okay? And so that's our history. Uh, du Bois, after he came out of the uh, W. Du Bois, after he came out of NAACP, right? He involved became a Pan Africanist, right? That's the reason why he's buried in Ghana today. You know what I'm saying? Uh, his whole process. You read Du Bois and read his his, his evolution, right? right? And you can people, see people don't want to talk about the talent. People always want to talk about the talent of tenth, but don't talk about how Du Bois, you know, died a Pan Africanist. You know what I mean? He Pan he's, he's the one that was created the first. Uh, international uh, Pan, Pan Africanist uh, 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 Convention, right? He was one of the uh, one of the first or the second uh, uh, of of the uh, Pan Africanist Convention, all right? And so people don't understand the history; they need to go back to that history. And so if you understand that history and the contribution of W. D. Du Bois, right, and Marcus Garvey, then you can see how we can or should be uh, recognize ourselves in terms of African people in the diaspora, that in in, in association with other African people in the world, 
then we become Pan African. All right. Now, well, I'll take a point further. Ghana, the only African nation that has openly, publicly stated that he want black people to become part of Ghana, to, to have us dual citizenship with Ghana. Public statement, right? They have dual citizenship with Ghana, right? They recognize that we are African people in the, in the diaspora, Ghana, the nation of Ghana, all right? Very similarly, uh, uh, the Jewish people, right, have dual, dual citizenship with the United States and Israel. Dual citizenship, no problem. No problem whatsoever. So my question then to black people in this country, how can we have not evolved and developed dual citizenship with any other country in Africa, right? That we find affiliation to or find affinity to? Why not? All right. And so again, we need to free our mind, decolonize ourselves, right? And think that we are quote unquote African, quote half American, <laughs> right? When well, we should be African, right? And recognize that and be and build our relationship with ourselves and the mother country, right? Uh, so that's my, my understanding and evolution in my understanding in terms of history uh, from Pan-African, from uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, and also from Marcus Garvey, with the idea of what it means and the importance of having uh, uh, principles and belief in Pan-Africanism. thousand percent. I know a little bit earlier you was talking about, you know, your comrades who are, who are still uh, locked up to this day. Um, can you talk about the Jericho movement that you co-founded as well as can you define what a, a political prisoner is for our, our, our listeners? Yeah. Um, some years ago, uh, the Republic of New Africa, RNA, used to have marches in, in uh, um, around uh, uh, the White House, and they called the Jericho March. All right, that's, that's, that's the inception. It came through the, the provisional government of the RNA. And um, I think it was in 1995 or 96, the RNA stopped having those marches in, in the White House, right, around the White House, calling for the release of political prisoners and et cetera. And so I had to ask the question, why, why is this being stopped? And no one did have an answer for me. And so what I did, I put out a call uh, to the movement to resurrect the uh, Jericho marches, okay? And um, a comrade, uh, Herman Ferguson, Baba Herman Ferguson, and um, Sophia Bukhari, Sister B Sophia Bukhari, heard my call. They came, we had meetings while I was in prison, and they decided, yes, we, we support you, Jalil, but we're gonna make this thing happen. So in 1998, uh, 6, 000, approximately 6,000 activists from across the country uh, marched, uh, organized themselves, and marched to Washington, D.C., and started the, the event of, uh, again, the resurrection of uh, what was the Jericho movement or Jericho marches. And because it was so well structured, well organized uh, by Sophia Bukhari and Herman Ferguson, uh, uh, both have are now gone to the ancestors. Uh, so I'm the only living uh, co founder of the Jericho movement. Uh, we decided that we would continue. That was in 1998 uh, with the building of a movement, movement in support of political prisoners, right? For the amnesty, fighting for the amnesty of political prisoners. And Jericho has been in existence for almost 20, 20 something years now, right? Uh, doing this work, doing this fight, trying to build support for political prisoners. Any of y'all out there listen to this, right? Go to your website. Download uh, uh, um, uh, Google, right? Jericho. Find one of your Jericho member, a Jericho chapter in your in your community, and join, right? If you're about to struggle, join Jericho, right? Be a part of this movement of free political prisoners. If you ain't free and political prisoners, then you ain't about no movement. It's a sham movement, as Audrey once said, right? Uh, it's a sham movement. If you ain't supposed to, hey, because any one of y'all can be a political prisoner. So what you saying? You know. So political prisoners, political prisoners is one who 
who were in prison or outside of prison, literally outside of prison, engaged in struggle and was illegally and or very perhaps legally, and I don't know how you can define legally when you have the laws in itself is criminal, uh, uh, been confined for the political activity and action, right, inside prison, uh, sent, sent to prison. Then you have those inside prison who are, uh, uh, who become politicized while in prison, right? And then they have changed their, their criminal mentality into a political mentality. And then they are engaging in the exercise of friend and mind, uh, behind will follow, right? And building structure, understanding, teaching, and, 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 and organizing inside prisons, right? And therefore their relation to the state has changed, right? And more often than not, they're being repressed because of how they think and how they behave, right? They think like a, like a free person and they behave like a free person. And in prison, that's dangerous, all right? They want you to be a slave and they want you to act like a slave in prison. And so therefore, um, <clears throat> those individuals, we also qualify, quantify and qualify as also being identified as political prisoners, right? Because they, their behavior, their thinking, their attitudes, uh, their commitment to struggle is that of politics, that of freeing, freeing uh, pr prisoners and freeing themselves, right? And so we qualify them as political prisoners. Now, there are some people who would say that anybody goes to the penitentiary because of the illegalities or the, the, uh, uh, the impossible, some say the impossibility of getting a fair trial because you're black in America, that only makes you a, a political prisoner. I negate that. I refute that idea. If you can't do the penitentiary because you're raping babies, right, you ain't no political prisoner. Right? You can't or convicted of that. I'm not saying rape. Let's say if you're convicted of that. And I'm saying if you know if you're innocent, that's another story, right? But if you're engaged in criminal behavior in the streets, right, selling drugs in our community, right, you're a crime. You're a criminal, right? So you 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 create a crime against humanity, you create a crime against our, our peoples, right? Uh and if you engage in those kind of activities. Right, for whatever reason that you engage in those reasons, economic reasons and so forth, there's an alternative for you to deal with your economic issue, right? Rather than poisoning our community, right? And inhibiting the development of our, of our people, right? So I, I ain't got no support of, of, of drug, drug dealers and, and anybody engaging in that, that kind of activity, right? Uh, and I would not, by virtue of you being in prison, identify you as a political prisoner. Nope, not happening. Yeah, I think um, I hadn't really considered the fact that, you know, while you may, let's say if I went to um, to prison for robbing banks and while I'm in there, I link up with uh, some folks who have directly come to prison because of their anti-colonial, anti-imperialist ways, right? And they then start to politically educate me and now I'm on the same hype as them. I didn't realize from that moment that I will start to experience the same repression while being locked up, uh, that they were experiencing, that hadn't something that hadn't had been something I had considered at all. And I don't think people think about that at all. I think when we think about political prisoners, we think of folks like yourself, folks like Asada, right? Who was like, oh, they was down with the movement from. However, like that's exactly what got them locked up is their anti-colonial, anti-imperialist mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. not realizing that one can become awakened while they locked up, and now you under, I, I what what. From your experience, what have you seen as far as like being able to see people become politically awakened and then them starting to be treated completely, like start to experience the same type of repression that you've experienced since the moment you got in there? What would that look like? Same thing I had to suffer, uh, being harassed all the time, had your cell searched for no reason, uh, uh, have your mail uh, tampered with, have your phone calls tapped, uh, 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 them uh, not giving you the kind of job that you are deserving inside the prison. Uh, whatever kind of menial job that may be, uh, uh, essentially it's pointing you out as the quote unquote uh, troublemaker, right? Because you are boisterous, uh, you're speaking against the system because the system is oppressive, right? Uh, or you will become a jailhouse lawyer, you know what I'm saying? And you fight for the rights of other prisoners. You, you have the, 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 the capacity, the human, uh, to use the law, right? To fight back, right? Uh, you, you'll be targeted for doing so. You know, hey, listen, man. Anytime you fight against oppression, you expect to great repression. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, that's nature of the game. You know, uh, 
and, and so um so those brothers inside the penitentiary or sisters also inside the penitentiary who has uh decided become woke right and recognize that the system is screwed right and then they not get a fair shot and then they have has some historical foundation in which they are engaged in the struggle right then you got to give kudos to them you know what i'm saying uh they on the track of fight back right and it's important man you know we don't leave them people hanging in, in, in the wind like that you know what i'm saying like they say they don't leave those soldiers left behind you know what i'm saying we can't leave our, our comrades in, in prison left behind and so we need to fight for the release of mutulu the release of uh our uh, uh, release of maroon release of chip right release of uh, uh Voranza, right not, you know the story Voranza was granted parole was granted parole was on the front door to walk out the penitentiary right and gonzalez was the attorney general at the time said he's not gonna release him right the superintendent was at the front door letting him go out the prison being released and gonzalez was the uh attorney general at the time uh uh send it back send it back to himself yeah he gave away everything in his property send it back to himself all right he's been in picture now for almost 10 years as a result of that having been already been granted parole by the pro board and they just didn't want to let him go all right illegal illegal straight up straight up illegal he's been held hostage for over 10 years Ronzo. yeah he's a political prisoner right we should be fighting for his release you know but if you don't know these stories you don't understand these things how are you gonna fight for them unless you realize it's important to build a mass movement all right okay so that's what that's what jericho is doing that's the work of jericho right and this is why jericho needs to be supported and jericho is 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 is, is not a black organization Right, because we know there are Native Americans that we support, like Linda Peltier, right? Uh, there are uh, 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 Mexican, uh, uh, Chicano uh, prisoners that we support. There are white prisoners we support, like David Gilbert, right? Yeah. Uh, whose whose son is now a uh, district attorney in, uh, uh, in San Francisco, right? Uh, and we, we fight for all the, all of their releases. Right? We ain't free them all. When 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 you say when you say mass movements, it's not just about the number of people, right? It's about the number of people while addressing all the forms of um uh, like imperialism and colonization. So like why when you touch on like the importance of yeah, like fighting for political prisoners, creating survival programs, that's yeah, what it's, it's not it's not separate. The one is not separate from the other. Okay. All right. No, one is not separate from this. It is building a, a mass movement for, for liberation and freedom. Okay. Uh, you know, we live in a system that's based upon profiteering and, and, and exploitation. All right. Uh, anytime you have uh, what, 600, 600 billionaires that control 90% of the wealth of 300, 360 million people, something wrong with that. Something wrong with that equation. Something extremely wrong with that equation. And, and, and it baffles me, I'm gonna be honest with you, it baffles me how the American population permit themselves to be exploited in that capacity, all right? 600 billionaires control 90% of the wealth of the country. You already 70. said it, it's our minds. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. even if you're looking at the pandemic so, right now too. Like, and so the rest of us, the rest of the, uh, of the American population it's fighting for 10% of the wealth. We fight for the crumbs. All right? So we need to identify those 600 billionaires. Right? We need to identify them 600 billionaires and say, yo, y'all got to ante up. You know what I'm saying? Y'all got to cut these, you know, these, these, these families, I think it's 2,800, 2,800 families. 600 billionaires, 2,800 families. We call the majority of the wealth of this country. You know, and, and we allow it to happen. Wait a minute. It, it, it baffles me how we are permitting that. You know, how the American population is permitting that. And then we're going to fight amongst each other for the crumbs mm -hmm. to fall off the table of these billionaires. Come on, man. Killing each other, robbing each other. But it just shows right. you how, how, how strong this uh, colonial propaganda has our minds just warped. Exactly. Completely exactly. warped. You, you, the propaganda is so good, we don't even identify it as propaganda sometimes. You know, from watching Netflix to watching YouTube, you don't even realize it sometimes. Even myself, I'm like, oh shit, this is propaganda. Bro, <laughs> this every, show I'm watching is pure propaganda. Bro, every, every, every breath we take in this world 
as black folks, as Africans, is being exploited, bro. Yeah. Every morning we get up and we are slaves to capitalism. Period. Every day, Period. we have no autonomy. We do not get to choose what we do every day at all. Yeah. I have no choice. I know I gotta make that dollar though. <laughs> And yeah, that's, I mean, that's one thing, even, you know, in uh, we are on Liberators, you know, you talk about like, you know, control the amount of time you're watching TV. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because there's so much propaganda coming out of it that I'm like, all right, yeah, like, even subconsciously, you know, I might just be watching this show to try to distract myself or whatever, you know, just have fun or whatever. But that shit is still controlling my mind in some type of way, subconsciously, to where I need to counteract all the propaganda that I'm you just know, science, watching. Bro. It's basically science. It's like, <laughs> so it's not on my like, oh, fuck, I need to go listen to a Kwame Ture speech, put that shit in, <laughs> and I'm playing, I'm playing video games at the same time. So I'm gonna get, you know, myself carrying, but I'm, I'm, I'm listening to these politics. You feel okay, me? So okay. let, me, let, me, let me add something to that too, as, as well, right? Sometimes we get so caught up in the struggle, so caught, get so caught up in the movement, that we don't go back and do some reflection and self healing. All right, uh, our sister Sophia Bukhari in her book, A War at Home, A War Before, right? She talks about that. And it's extremely important that uh, our activists read that book. You said uh, War sister, Before? It's called War Before. The War Before, right? By sister uh, Sophia Bukhari, right? It's extremely important that you read that book because in that book, she talks about the need for us to be engaged in self, to have a retreat, to retreat and engage in self healing, right? Or to, to decompress, essentially. Because we can become so tied up and so caught up in the struggle, right? Uh, uh, that we uh, begin to essentially, you know, uh, become fractionalized, you know, uh, uh, in, our, in our own thinking, right? Uh, we become, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't, find it. I can't think of the word right now. Uh, isolated. We become, huh? Isolated. No, 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 not, not isolated, but we become so uh, uh, caught up in the struggle that we, 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 we often, we hurt ourselves, yeah. right? Mentally and psychologically, we hurt ourselves, uh, and uh, we are because we are saying too much trauma, right, from the people, right, and trying to work on areas of healing that trauma, right, by providing all these different services, and it's like a like a nurse in the trauma in the, in the trauma unit, right, going and healing people day after day after day after day, you know, and, and seeing death and seeing uh, uh, people being injured and hurt. You know, and how do they survive that? They got to go back and they got to go to retreat, you know what I mean, to decompress for a period of time. And the same thing for us in, in the movement, in the struggle, right? Uh, there's a point in time where we have to take a retreat, have to go back and decompress, you know, uh, and restrict them to heal, all right? And then go back and go back into into the fray again. What, what would that, what would that, what does that look like for you? Because something that I, that I've, like you said, we all struggle with it, but it's also something that I've found like motivating from watching you is you have a, a certain joy and optimism as someone who's witnessed um, some of the most heinous acts that this country can impose on impose onto our people. Like, what what do you do for, for healing and to, and to recharge? <laughs> oh, I write poetry. Right, some of them put in my book, some of them I don't. Right, I just get away, I shut down, and I go inside myself. Right, and I just let it come out in, in, in poetic form. You know what I mean? And I release. It's also, I pray. Right, I make my prayers, bro. You know what I'm saying? I believe in in, in the divine. Right, I believe in the power of prayer, and that's my solace. Right, and so I, I do that. Right, uh, all right, and let me tell you, let me tell you a story. Um, I was locked in Old Queens, um, uh, and it was four of us in, in a whole tier, just four, right, in New York City. It was in 1972. And uh, the four of us was Max Sanford, um, uh, Rap Brown, myself, and a guy named Collins. He was, a, he was just a, a notorious bank robber. And at the time, I thought myself being, I'm a black communist, man. You know what I'm saying? And I, uh, I remember, I remember seeing that interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Marxist Leninist. <laughs> Marxist -Leninist. All, that, all that religion, you don't talk to me about religion. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear none of that. None of that. I want to hear none of that. Right? I was a dialectic historical materialist, period. And that's how the niggas be selling on Twitter. I swear. <laughs> 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 Period. And so, and so Max Stafford, 
And Matthew was the leader of Ram, Revolutionary Action Movement. Okay. And you know who uh uh Rap Brown was, right? Jamil Al Amin. Yeah. Right? And I used to see these two guys, they get up in the morning, do their prayers, right? Five times a day doing their prayers. Right. Matt Stanford became Muhammad Ahmed. And uh and and Rap Brown became uh, Jamil Al Amin, Abdul Al Amin, right? And I used to battle with him. I'm just man, you know, your knees and praying, blah, 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 blah. Right? <laughs> and uh, for about six months, I argued with him uh, about this, this, this whole idea. I had read a book called uh, 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 Anti Doring, right, by, uh, by Frederick Ingalls. And it was dealing with questions of metaphysics, uh, the metaphysical world, right? Metaphysical means other than the physical, okay? And he, he basically, he was making the point of uh, arguing towards materialism, that we live in a materialistic world, right? And materialism. And so, <clears throat> uh, so that was my position in regards to these issues of spirituality, right? Now, keep in mind two things, right? One, I was baptized as 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 a Catholic, right? Uh, by, by my mom, you know, as a baby, right? Uh, I went to a uh, Catholic school for about five years. We share that in common. <laughs> yeah, right? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, but I rejected it, right? Because I, I, I can't believe this, this, this Trinity thing, you know? Uh, that they believe in, you know, and that, that just didn't fit right for me, you know, logic didn't fit right for me. And so, um, uh, so making that kind of argument with Muhammad Ahmed and uh, Jamil al right, we came to one conclusion. And basically, we had what are called a Faustian compromise, right? Uh, be damned if you do, be damned if you don't kind of compromise. And the one thing that I, as a scientist, in my thinking, one thing that I could not get rid of the fact that <clears throat> energy never dies. Physics will tell you the energy transmute and transform. The energy never dies. So this thing, this energy that we call life, right? This spark of where, where it is, we call life, this energy, right? If it doesn't die, then where does it go? After it leaves this body, after this body, this physical entity disappears, what happened to this energy? They just dissipate into the into the ethers and disappear. And if it does so, does it take consciousness with it, right? Because there's nothing that we have not yet really defined is the issue of consciousness. Some people say science, social scientists would say consciousness comes from your your social environment, right? But then the question then is, if a baby was put in a closet in the dark for all its life, would they have a consciousness, right? There are no other social experiences right that they can relate upon right would it have consciousness and my conclusion my thinking is that it would it would be thinking upon themselves and the world that, that it is in in that closet right but more so than anything else it would think upon himself okay and so if energy never dies then the faustian compromise is if energy never dies and there is not there is not a heaven or an afterlife Right? Then you don't lose nothing. Okay? But then if there is an afterlife, and then you're not adhering to the criteria from which that the afterlife allegedly, allegedly says this is how you're supposed to live, then you lose everything going forward after this incarnation. So the question then to me is that <clears throat> when a baby is in the womb, right, does it know about the world outside of the womb? Right. And there's a possibility that this world is a womb for the next world. Stay with me now. All right? Because there's a separation between, there's a barrier between one form of existence to the next form of existence. All right? That's growth and development. And so for me, in that understanding of science, scientifically, I hear it's my best. All right? That perhaps there is something beyond this incarnation. Right, that I cannot accept that this is the end of be all and end all, right? If in fact energy transmute and transform, perhaps it takes consciousness with you, with it, right? And then there is something where you go into the next evolutionary development of our quote unquote existence. And on the basis of that understanding, we try to be scientific, right? Trying to be a materialist. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I had to come to the conclusion, I had to come to the conclusion that the perhaps there might be something else behind after this 
this incarnation. And therefore, I'm hedging my bet that there is. And that there are some, some un, uh, uh, phenomenons that we have yet really to tie into, really, uh, really define uh, in regards to what's going on in, in, our, in our existence in our world that will indicate that there may be something beyond this here. Uh, and so, as as Rap said, as Jamil uh, Alameen wants to ask, he said, "Listen, man, you're a good person, right?" I said, "Yeah, man, I'm a good person, man." And he said, "He said, he said, well, if you're a good person, then you ain't gonna lose nothing but become a Muslim, right? Can you be still doing the same thing you're doing anyway? But you're hedging your bets for the hereafter. That makes sense to me, right? And if it ain't no hereafter, then you ain't lost nothing. But if it is, you lost everything going forward." According to the religion, according to the doctrine of the religion. All right. All right. So uh, there's some other experiences that I've had that you know that led me to uh, uh, some idea, some inkling that there's more to this existence than this this, this present incarnation. You know, uh, <clears throat> and I'm not going to go into that you know right now. But yeah. So and, and that's the reason why. And also historically, in terms, particularly in in the United States. All of the major leaders of our movement, they believe in a God. Some form of spirituality. Some form of spirituality. From the Reverend Nat Turner to Malcolm X to Martin Luther King, then Mark Vesson, uh, 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 Gabriel Prosser, uh, all the way up, right? Each of them believe in the divine. It may be a different divine, you know, in name. But they believe in something of a higher being, a higher self, a higher consciousness. All right. And so that is another experience of us in this country that we have been holding on to. Unfortunately, it's been bastardized because of what has been taught to us in our oppression. All right. Uh, uh, that everything's going to be good in the by and by, as an example. All right. And so, therefore, you just suffer now. And you'll get your freedom later, right? And you'll be free later. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's bull. Man, that ain't that ain't what this thing is about. All right. Uh, you can have freedom here too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in, and in the after. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the last thing that that uh, that uh, um, that was important to me in terms of I had to ask I had to ask Jamil out of me and say, listen, man, if I if I do this here. Uh, that means that I got to be like them, them Christians, you know, and uh, 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 get slapped in the, on the cheek and have to turn the other cheek to get slapped again. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no. He said, no. That's not, that's he said, no, nah, brother, not right here, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not what this is about, though. Because in the book, it says, fight, fight tumult and oppression wherever you may find it. Right? That's a quote in the Quran. Fight tumult and oppression wherever you may find it. And two more of the oppression is worse than slaughter. Those are quotes in the Quran, right? The two more of the oppression is worse than slaughter. When you oppress somebody, you take away their human dignity. That's worse than just killing them, right? When you make a person a slave, that's worse than just killing them. So fight two more of the oppression wherever you may find it. Okay, and that's where you restore your own humanity. Your own humanity. But recognizing that you're a part of someone else's freedom. Yeah. A thousand percent. And I realized for myself over the years, like a lot of the people I've looked up to, like Malcolm, you know, yourself, and you know, my OG uh, Amir, a lot of them have been black Muslims. You know, and my, my partner Amir, he was putting me on, like a lot of uh black folks who came, you know, who were captured and taken here from the continent to America, they were Muslim. You know, even in, in the church, um, they were writing messages from the Quran in the church as they were forced to build the church. And, you know, they right. was in there saying that, you know, we're praying for Christ, whatever, lying to the to Massa and was actually praying to Allah. You yeah, know, so true. there's a, a deep black Muslim history in, in this in this country. There, there, that there's two, there's two, in the history of the, of the United States, there's two trends that has been, what has been evolved throughout the diaspora. And that's the religion of Islam and the traditional uh, Yoruba uh, uh, tradition, right? Two major ones that consistently come from all of Africa and been integrated in one way or another in the, the religious or the belief system in here in the United States, you know? 
uh, the, the, the Yoruba uh, religion, and also uh, um, the uh, um, uh, Islamic uh, tradition, all right? And where the Yorubas had taken the saints of the Christian saints and, and, and evolved them into their own uh, 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 iconic, iconic ecology, iconology of, of, of parts of the, of the religion. All right, and so uh, so those traditions come coming out of Africa, or uh, Northeast Africa and Africa uh, are the mainstays uh, that maintains our, our spiritual uh, uh, foundation, right? <clears throat> uh, in the struggle, uh, yeah. I have one. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that was perfect. <laughs> that, that was okay. I I got I got one last question. Um, and it came up, it came up in our class the other day. Um, but you mentioned like I, I don't meet me and Blake be just in the house talking about this shit twenty four seven stressed out. But like trying to find that balance between understanding that it's it's a marathon, but there are actions that we need to be taking every day so that we do in fact do what you said, like leave something behind for the next generation, and that we do right by our elders like yourself and what y'all have left for us and building on that. Um, but in the class you mentioned like, man, we got like 25, 30 years and this thing is over type shit. And so I wanted, could you, uh, <laughs> could you elaborate on how we supposed to be running a marathon, but we also have these crucial years ahead of us where we got to make some real strides in order to cement yeah. our chances that can discontinue marathon. Yeah, especially too, you know, with the rise of, you know, tr Trump, and you know the the violence from his uh, his supporters and his uh, white militias, the, the, the white militias and these uh, neo confederates. Um, yeah. Well, all right. <laughs> part of this part of this uh, entire uh, not understanding, right? In, in regards to history, remember now history is, is a foundation for which you have to move forward. You don't know the history. Know where you've been, you ain't gonna know where you need to go. Okay. Uh, so we have to understand history. And so <clears throat> uh, in 1918, and they had that pandemic, the flu, Spanish flu, came yeah. across this country, right? Uh, the pandemic. And uh, after that pandemic, 1919, from 1919 to 1925, right? White folks went crazy. Right. Uh, and there was the Red Summer, where it's killing black people from Illinois down to 1925, the destruction of, of, of Tulsa. All right. Uh, and so we find similarly today that came same history. All right. Uh, where after the pandemic, or as a part of part of this process of the pandemic, right, white folks acting crazy again. Right, and so is, is history repeating itself? Uh, some might say yes. Okay, uh, what they did in uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, in the Capitol was telling uh, the state of this country, the state of this union, this alleged union. Right, <clears throat> uh, 70, 000, 70 million people voted for Trump as a hero, a white supremacist. Okay, and I would imagine there's probably 30, another 30 million who are silent, uh, silent supporters of this idea of, of white supremacy. And so I don't see, with that understanding, with, with, with this history of this country, I don't see it going away, all right? Uh, go back to history, again, go back to Civil, Civil, Civil War. Uh, and the uh, the surrender of the Confederates. Uh, that surrender was not a defeat. The Confederates were never defeated. All right, they were dismantled as a military force. The Hayes Tilden Compromise gave them an opportunity to resurrect. All right, I believe in 19, 1940, 20,000 Klansmen and then dressing the regalia, Washington, Washington, marched in Washington. All right, had a had a had a ticket pit, uh, a, a parade in Washington D.C. 
20,000. That informs uh, today when we saw what happened in uh, was it North Carolina or South Carolina, uh, where the sister Ahaya uh, was, was killed. A young young woman was murdered. Uh, by ran over by the car. Remember Charleston a couple years ago? Wasn't that yeah, Charleston? Yeah, Charleston. Charleston. Yeah, Charleston. Yeah. Charleston. Okay, cool, Charleston. And then they had the uh, those uh, white folks was was marching, carrying about the Jews never uh, replace us, and etc. Right? They had a big march, the ticket, and throwing the candles and things of that nature. <clears throat> uh, so it's, it's been a process by which they have trying to resurrect themselves, resurrect the, the, the Confederate, resurrect the South. And uh, hold that in juxtaposition to our migrating back to the South, mm -hmm. black people migrating back to the Black Belt, right? Uh, a book that just recently came out, The Devil You Know, by a game named Charles Blow, right? And I, while I don't agree with everything of his analysis in regards to that, he has made the petition that black people should return back to the South, right? And be re-empowered by numbers, by numbers. So as we move forward, my thinking, the possibility, and I'm not, I can't predict, right? But the possibility exists being a dialectic historical materialism, using the principle of historical materialism, right? Uh, we can make certain equations, formulas, and so as social scientists, to see the possibilities that there's going to be a major uproar in this country in a few more years, right? Uh, where it's going to be torn apart. That's a possibility. So if we put that in the possibility category, right? Then what do we do in terms of addressing that issue of that possibility? <clears throat> And that's the reason why it's so important in my thinking that we first are preparing ourselves for liberation and independence. Emancipation, abolition, and liberation. Mm -hmm. All right. And so that's the reason why I said that I don't think in the next 25 years uh, that we're going to have another resurgence, another resurgence that will be cataclysmic in this country. And we need to be prepared for that. Okay, and so uh, them 70 million plus, they ain't going away. For the other white folks who are the sisters and brothers and aunties and uncles and, and grand grandfathers and, grand and grandmothers of them 70 million, they ain't addressing it. And if they don't address that, if they don't shut that down, this country is done. Done. Okay, so white folks got to get better, get get busy with the with them other white folks, and straighten that out. That they want to keep this country, right? And they can't blame us, black folks and people of color, for what's happening in this country. They can only blame themselves. All right, and for as I can see right now, it's done. You know, and, I don't, and I'm an optimist. I'm I'm the optimist. I ain't the pessimist. I'm the optimist <laughs> in this matter, all right? And from the understanding of dialectics, understanding the principles of social sciences, all right? Um, if these matters are not addressed uh, up front and straight up, in terms of 70 million plus, uh, and this guy, uh, Trump, uh, still uh, being able to rally his troops because uh, he's an egomaniac, maniacal uh, monster, and I'll put it that way, All right. uh, that he's going to be part and parcel of the destruction of this country. If he can't control it, he's going to destroy it. All right. And they're going to go down with it. And I'm saying the black folks, Save your behind, free your mind, and your behind will follow. We got to get out the way. We got to get out the way. And like I said before, white supremacy, you'll be white supremacy, be white supremacy. You'll go over there and be that white supremacist. So come up here and mess with me. Don't mess with us, right? Go about your business. 
all right? You white folks, you got issues you got to deal with white folks, okay? It's when you try to impose your white supremacy upon me that I will defend myself. We have, I have an inherent right to self-preservation. Everybody does. It's our human right. Human right. Fuck what the law say. We got our human right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you understand my point, right? Yeah. Play yep. rational and logical. Yep. All right. And if you understand the science, you understand history, <clears throat> then we, we, we also understand that there's issues that could be good. And they're planning for it. You know, they already told you, say, we're going to be having a civil war. They, I mean, shit, as soon as uh, the pandemic hit and you know, they're talking about Trump getting out of office. All these gun spikes, you know, they buying all the guns. They yeah, buying all yeah. the ammos. It's it's clear on, as day. You know, here, even in Napa, there was a, a white dude who just got arrested. He with, you know, 50 plus guns, pipe bombs, and, you know, he a white supremacist. Yeah, yeah. So, they, so they're preparing, you know, they're getting, they getting ready to do what they're going to do. You yep. know? <clears throat> and uh, that's why we got to be future focused, huh? Future focused, my brother. Future focused, you know? Yes, you have to be future focused. You know what I mean? Uh, we can't dwell in the past. We can't. And I can't. Can't actually dwell in the here and now. You know what I'm saying? We got to prepare for the, for what's coming up in in the future. And so we have to be future focused. You know, we have to think in our minds and in, in our thinking in terms of what, what we are doing. That's to preserve our, our lives today, so we have something to give to our babies tomorrow. All right. We got to be future focused, and we got to build towards our own liberation, our own independence. All right. Decolonization, right? We need to decolonize our mind so we can decolonize our, 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 our practice. All right? So that, that's that's the deal, bro. Appreciate you. This is uh, so amazing to have this conversation. Yeah, I <laughs> Words can't even describe it, you feel me? It's, it's not only affirming, but just, you know, if you a hell of a black listener, if you listen to the first episode to now, it's like, you know, your name has came up a long, a lot of times, you know what I'm saying? And for you to be on here, it's, it's, it's a blessing, man. Thank you, cuz. Appreciate you and I love you, man. I love you too, my brother. Love yeah. you too, Delancey. Yeah, I, I love you too, man. I know, I, um, I love and appreciate you. I, I can't say it enough. Um, like I think oftentimes I think about the impact that you've had on me as an organizer, but now I'm starting to, to really understand the impact that you're having on me as a human being. Um, and I, I thank you for, for leaving um, guided principles and actions for us to follow. Um, and I, I think, you know, this year, which you only have been home for like the last like five or six months, I think this is just but a, a small piece of the impact that we're gonna have on folks, whether it's the podcast, um, the class that you're doing, you know, we're gonna be able to do a, a lot of, meaningful and impactful work in the name of liberation and unification. So uh, I want to just thank you again. But let me let me make maybe one more one more uh point. Um <clears throat> one more, let me just raise one more issue. I got a bunch of issues, but let me just raise one more. <laughs> <laughs> just raise one more. Here I'm I'm in Rochester and uh, I'm a um I'm a uh, organizer for uh, citizen action, right? It's a statewide organization here in Rochester doing some good work you know, and, and dealing with the issues of, of oppression and uh, uh, questions of white supremacy and 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 uh, those, those kind of things in, in this in this state. A lot of the work is done through lobbying and trying to get the laws changed. Remember, the laws is the things that make, moves people to do the things that they do in their behavior, right? Uh, we didn't talk about policing today, but policing is based upon law, okay? And the law is, is what protects the police and the police is fulfilling the obligations they have Towards uh, maintaining the law, right? Uh, Coming from uh, child, well, I'm gonna get it there, but from child slavery uh, to where the police actually came into existence as slave patrols uh, to today, and they're still operating the same concepts and principles. Right? And the law uh, with them was that they uh, captured the slaves and put the slaves away, you know, put them back in their place and their order. And basically, that's what the police is doing today. That's how they operate, right? Based on that history. <clears throat> At any rate. What I would like for us to do, and I'm just making this proposal, right? I'm trying to make this proposal here in, in, in Rochester. Uh, Rochester is uh, a school district. It's one of the worst, or I think the worst, the fifth worst school district uh, in the state of Cal state of uh, New York, right? Uh, the babies here, uh, the young people here, 
uh, the school system is tore up, tore up from the floor up, right? And we need to figure out a new way to how to change that. Um, here you have in Rochester, the, the majority of the students are black and Hispanic, right? The majority of the teachers, 80% of the teachers are white women, right? And I think there's another three or four or five percent of, of white men. Uh, all of these people have been teaching black babies, black and brown babies, right? And that's a problem, right? It's a problem of identity. It's a problem of the way they are being taught. Uh, in, in essence, in, in certain instances, whether it's innate or overt, uh, 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 the issues of white skin privilege, it seeps into the processes of, of teaching these kids, teaching these babies. And there's no wonder why they not wanted to go to school or uh, deal with the issues of school. And so, and then there's the myriad of other issues uh, that these kids are trying to bring into the school building, you know, whether it be a question of gang violence, uh, uh, drugs, uh, domestic violence, uh, uh, food deserts, um, um, uh, poverty, homelessness, uh, all these issues they've been brought into the school building as they're trying to learn. And so my thinking is that let's take the African proverb. Remember, I don't think it, I think it's the African, right? So let's take the African proverb of um, it takes a village to raise a child, right? That's the African proverb. If it takes a village to raise a child, and we have these buildings embedded in these communities, right? We call buildings, I'm calling these school buildings, these edifices, embedded in these communities. So let's change, let's, why not change our, the paradigm of what school is being used, these buildings are being used. If it takes a village to raise a child, why not we take these buildings and turn them into the village, right? Let's take these buildings and have every resource that these kids need to learn in these buildings, because they're already better in the community, all right? So we need to change our paradigm the way we teach across the country, right? But particularly here in Rochester, right? And, uh, and so, where we teaching the A, B, and C's and the one, twos, and threes, right? We also need to teach healthcare, right? Uh, uh, restorative justice, uh, um, uh, ethnic studies, um, um, uh, issues dealing with homelessness, right? Um, things that we, the Black Panther Party originally started, feeding these babies, nutrition, proper nutrition, right? And we need to take these resources, all these resources that's available and put them in these buildings. That's already better in the community. And therefore, a kid will come to come to school knowing that these resources are there for them, right? Beyond the ABCs and the one, twos, and threes, right? He get everything else that he needs to be to be a, a whole human being, not a fracture of a human being that society has already created. And that's the reason why. And this is the way we stop the prison, we stop the school to prison pipeline. All right? That's my main focus. That's my main focus. I don't want to see these babies, these kids going to the penitentiary, All right? Let's stop that. And we can stop it by creating a new paradigm of educating these kids, all right? And making these buildings that village. And if we can do that, we'll change this whole structure. We'll change this whole foundation. And we make education real and not trying to teach people to become a cogwheel in the capitalist system. Hmm. Community control of education, huh? There you, there you go. That's what we need. That's what we need. Decolonization. Decolonization program, bro. All right? These yeah. edifices there, let's take control of these kids. Let's take control of these edifices and make them function the way they're supposed to function for our babies. Yep. That's things we need to be doing here. People's programs got to start moving Without towards, question. towards that. So. All right, so I give that to y'all. Yeah, thank I'll, I'll, you. I'll do something with that. <laughs> I'll do something with that. You just did a virtual drop mic. All right, y'all. Y'all <laughs> take that and go do something. Figure it out. Y'all figure, figure it out. We are home <laughs> ready. That's what that's what I'm trying to do here, bro. You know what I mean? That's what I'm trying to do, right, Chester? So, yeah, I think you get done. You know, yeah, it's needed. Yeah, you know. Uh, it's needed. We need we need to make make a new paradigm, you know, in terms of teaching. Uh, decolonization we need to build build a new edifice, a new way of thinking in terms of teaching. We need to, we need to bring that village together to raise these babies, man, raise these children. That's extremely important. The next generation as they take the struggle to the next level. Yeah.